video games for about 17 years in front of a television camera. Uh, but my purpose here today is for something I find to be far more exciting than anything like that. I'm joined with Other Side Games. This is a group of very, very seasoned developers who are bringing back the Underworld franchise, okay. Underworld Ascendant, okay. and... Uh, I'm here. Oh, Adam, yeah. so Adam you've got... No... I started this thing up. I realized maybe it wasn't going. <laughs> We're live now in We're front of thousands. Now. Okay. As I was saying, guys, I'm Adam Susser. Very, very happy to be joined with Other Side Games, uh, a team of exceptionally seasoned developers who are working on Underworld Ascendant. It is a revival of the incredibly classic Ultima Underworld franchise that really kind of set the stage for a silent game that we're very familiar with now. Uh, kind of a, a, an open-ended, play-it-as-you-want style of game. Uh, they have a Kickstarter that's going on that we're obviously encouraging all of you to donate to so this game can come to fruition. But what's more exciting is many of the people joining us that are with Other Side and some of our special guests have worked on yet another classic game of that genre, and that is the much-beloved game from Wooden Glass Studios, System Shock 2. Uh, right now we are joined by Paul Nurath. He is the founder of Other Side Games. Um, Paul, uh, if you wouldn't mind just giving me a quick sense of who you are now and who you were when, uh, when, when Looking Glass and Irrational were working on System Shock 2. It's a very philosophical question. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I founded uh, uh, Blue Sky, which developed the original Underworlds, and then that uh, studio morphed into Looking Glass, where we did uh, System Shock and System Shock 2 with Irrational. Uh, as well as Thief and, and some other pretty pretty good games. Um, and then uh, uh, fast forward uh, a few years, uh, we just started up Other Side Entertainment uh, to bring uh, the Underworld franchise uh, back to a whole new audience. All right. Well, there you go. That is Paul. Paul, um, who, who is sitting next to you there? Or, or, or do you have anybody accompanying you right now over there at the Other Side? Uh, in fact, I am not alone. So next to me is Tim Stomach. I'll let him introduce himself. Sure. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, my name is Tim Stelmach. Uh I was a very, very early employee at Looking Glass Studios, uh, working on Ultima Underworld, and then was later lead designer on Underworld 2. I was on the design team for not System Shock 2, but the original System Shock. Um, and so System Shock 2 was actually, I think, the first Looking Glass action adventure game that I got to play without having developed it, which was a delight. Mm -hmm. And I am currently a lead designer here at Other Side Entertainment, working on uh, Underworld Ascendant. All right. Uh, we are joined by some other uh, special guests, uh, one name that should be familiar to a lot of people, uh, from Irrational Games, the, the, the founder of Irrational Games, Ken Levine. You may know him these days from his association with uh, the, the Bioshock franchise, but you worked quite closely on, on, on System Shock as well, Ken. Uh, was, was, was that your first outing as a designer, or? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean so uh, we, um, I, I would work, I, you know, Paul, hired, Paul and crew hired me. Um, pretty much all those guys there probably were interviewing me the day I came on board at Looking Glass in 1995, uh, which is my first game job. And I worked for a, thief, for a while on Thief, um, and then after some time, about a year and a half there, we went off to form Irrational, and um, Paul gave us a call. Um, that was, and I saw I'm a co-founder of Irrational Games, John Che and Rob Fermi and myself. And um, we were, you know, like all startups, completely broke and having no idea how we were going to, like, pay the rent. And uh, the phone rang one day, and Paul said, hey, how would you guys like to come back and use the engine that you used when you worked, all worked on Thief um, and make a, 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 a game with us? Um, and we said, yeah, are you guys buying lunch? And um, they were buying lunch. And, um, and it was also, it turned into an opportunity to work on, to me, the sequel to um, my, you know, my, probably my favorite at the time, my favorite game of all time, which was System Shock 1. And um, both Underworld and System Shock were incredibly influential to me as a gamer, uh, hugely. 
And uh, another gentleman who's joining us is someone who I know you used to work with, Ken. Um, it's Steve Grainer from Fulbright Studios. Excuse should be Fulbright Company. I always get that wrong. Uh, best known right now for Gone Home. But Steve, uh, it's my thing working with Ken. We uh, play uh, System uh, Shock a lot, I guess. Uh, talking uh, to one uh, of our uh, usual uh, friends. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. You know, System Shock 2 uh, was one of just the big formative kind of... Uh, influences on me as like what kind of games I wanted to make and what kind of games inspired me and I feel incredibly lucky to have gotten to work with Ken for a little while at Irrational and uh, you know learn from the master <laughs> before going off on my own. Well guys thank you all for joining uh, as, as obviously everyone out there can see we are starting to begin setting up a game of, of, of System Shock 2. Uh, actually just kind of looking at all the ways that you can toggle the settings from a, a classic game, a PC game from the 90s is, is, is bringing back quite a bit of memories. But um, I'd love to hear from just some of you guys about the experience of working on the game, and, and, and maybe Paul. I mean, if you think about it, you guys didn't have, maybe the best you have was the Ultimate Underworld games as, as a roadmap for something as ambitious as a game as System Shock, and obviously System Shock 2 were going to be. I mean, did you know what you were getting yourself into? Uh, we didn't, which was probably just as well. Um, when, when we did the original System Shock, that was a follow-up uh, after we had done uh, Ultimate Underworld 2. And we had done two fantasy role-playing games in a row. Partly we just wanted to shift gears you know, creatively. And so take what we would learned from doing the Underworld games and uh, try science fiction with some uh, cyberpunk elements uh, uh, rolled into that so it was it was a using the same technology or an updated on the same technology we built uh but the original system shock was just a crazy game we put so much into that game uh, it's just insane uh, and then system shock 2 which we're playing now was um, five years later we were developing that uh so it was quite a bit later and then we we're using a new generation engine at that time the thief engine um, and we'd learn more about technology and what to do with it. Uh, much more polished experience than the, uh, the original System Shock. Uh, but, uh, yep. I was going to say, that, that's, a, that, that's a very interesting point, because obviously to be able to have a game that offered that much for the player to sort of do and make their own decisions about how to play the game, there's, there's a huge burden on the technical to be able to support that. But then, obviously, Paul, Ken, uh, and, and, um, and, and Tim, how do you start to, just from a design standpoint, start to anticipate what you want the player to do and knowing that that will actually be successful and an entertaining experience? I mean, that seems even more like a, like a, a great unknown. Yeah, I, that's very true. And it, it actually gets into a part of our process at Looking Glass, which has a lot to do with how uh, System Shock 2 came out of the work that we'd been doing on Thief. Uh, it was always a very iterative process, and we were we were keenly aware that any plan does not survive contact with the enemy. Uh, so we were we were really focused on creating data-driven tools for development that we could use to to be very very agile in the course of development and pursue ideas uh, as they suggested themselves. Uh, having your first playable game, you always get uh, get ideas that are suggested by that that never would have occurred to you before. So we had very flexible tools, and in fact. Uh, as a consequence of that, when, when System Shock 2 was in early development, it actually ran on the same executable for a while that we were using on Thief with just a, a different data set. Uh, obviously, that, that would branch later in the course of development. Um, but, uh, you know, the, really the, the, the short answer and one of the keys to development is you, you really, you can't really know everything ahead of time if you want to be able to really uh, use the best ideas as, they, as, as the project develops. I mean, that, that, that sounds both ex ex exhilarating and terrifying. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I mean, what was it like? Like, okay, I think I know what we want to do. We just don't know how we're going to get there. Step into the grab shafts to proceed to the um, street level. Uh, yeah, so it, it was interesting because we had worked on, John and, and Rob and I had worked on Thief, and that and Thief at the time, the, the engine for Thief was, it was an engine that, um, uh, that Looking Glass had developed internally, and it wasn't finished. And it was, um, and it wasn't like we were using Unreal, and it was, you know, a commercial product. It was, it was, a, it was in fairly 
it because it, it no games had shipped on it yet and um it also like tim said did think something's better data-driven stuff and did something's worse like it wasn't it wasn't the fastest rendering engine in the world out there like compared to a, a quake or something at the time um and so we made certain decisions early on about you know and looking at so that was a limitation to some degree um but but we actually decided that you know when talking when we pitched the game paul and talked to paul about it that we would try to embrace that. And the way we were gonna embrace that was to go for a much more survival horror feel, so a slower paced feel with much more limited, uh, like limited ammunition, limited, you know, the, the, the infamous gun deterioration system, which some people loved and some people absolutely despised us. So there was Twitter back then. Um, I, I, I heard, <laughs> heard a lot about it. Um, and, um, but also, you know, to combining really first person shooting and RPGs, because we knew we needed to have a selling point that couldn't mean 100% on shooting because we weren't fully competitive with the, you know, an engine like Quake, a super fast engine like Quake. But we could put lots of objects in it, and those objects have relatively deep data properties. And, um, but we did make changes to the engine, like for instance, um, Thief. Um, Thief was a, a software engine. There's, you probably don't, most people probably don't remember what such a thing is anymore, but it, it, it ran uh, entirely on the processor of, 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 Paul, do you want to talk about software engine? You probably, you probably have a better, under, you came from software engines originally, so you probably have a much better understanding of them. Yeah, back in the day when I was actually still coding, I, I wrote software engines. So, uh, just one word, slow and, or sluggish, just take your pick. Um, yeah, we, we, we struggled at times to get really good performance out of the engines, and, and particularly the hardware at that time. But we would just push it as hard as we could. Um, we weren't so much concerned that you know you needed a pretty powerful PC for that era in order to get a smooth experience. Um, it, it was more about you know how far can we push this, um, and we kind of had an eye out to well you know a year after the game is released, it'll actually be enough. PCs out there that can run it decently, and of course today when you play it, it's it's wonderfully smooth. He <laughs> <laughs> decided to make some changes, like because Thief, Thief was a, a had no colored lighting and it was a software engine. We felt needed colored lighting, as you can see probably from the images you're you're seeing that colored lighting was really critical to making the look of System Shock 2 work. In fact, some of the levels are entirely white, and you can't tell that because we, instead of coloring the textures, we color the, the lighting. Um, and a lot of what you're seeing is not actually coming out of texture, it's coming out of lighting. But that meant we had to be hardware only, which limited the number of, of PCs out there we could sell to. So I think we you know, talked to EA and sort of, you know, Paul went to EA, and I assume you had to like bend some arms over there um, and have them be okay with essentially limiting the market. and. Um, um, but we, but I think it's why the game holds up visually more, more than some games from that period because we made such a strong choice to, to really embrace that aspect of, 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 of the engine. Um, but we basically, you know, Sean Barrett had to go back and rewrite, you know, the engine a lot for, to make to accommodate this. I, 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 Steve, I, I think you're the one who's playing the game the the most right <laughs> now. I mean, I, 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 I think that really makes a statement that. There, there is a lot about this game that is held up. I mean, I'm just, just, just kind of going back and, and watching this now. The depth of the design and that kind of like, okay, I'm gonna get myself really lost in it. Is, 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 is coming back to me. But I, I love to hear sort of your thoughts about what about this game still holds up now and really seems to capture your imagination. I, I think that there are, you know, there's certain there's certain games that uh, are fortunate to, yeah, kind of um, be timeless in a lot of ways. I mean, you go back and play. System Shock 2, and especially System Shock 1, and there are things that are, let's say, less accessible about them <laughs> to a modern gamer than uh, when they came out. But, um, I mean, something that I think speaks volumes is the fact that there's been, you know, players modding the games ever since, you know, they were first released to, like, make them more accessible and more playable because they believe, you know, people in the modern day want to be able to experience these games, even though, you know, System Shock 1, if you just you know, try to install it out of the box, you're not gonna be able to run it, it doesn't have mouse look and stuff. But fans have gone back and, and kind of added all those features and made it so you can still have access to these games in this day and age because the core experience of this immersion and player-driven um, kind of uh, decision-making, exploration, finding about 
finding out about this place and building your character to like play the way that you want to, um, I think it's just something that people always desire more of in games, you know? And you know, now we're into the, like, we're right now into the game proper and we've moved out of the training. So I'd love to kind of uh, hand it over to, to you guys for a little bit for, I think, aspects of our audience that may not be as familiar because holding a, 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 a round ball in your hand is not kind of a you know, <laughs> weapon to a lot of people. And uh, it might be great to get a little bit of context of both what we're looking at and how the game is being played. So the round ball is basically the predecessor to the left hand, right hand thing you see in Bioshock of, of that. In the left, right hand, you have weapons, and in the right, left hand, you have sort of magic powers. And at that point, um, you didn't have it; you couldn't do both at once. So you have this thing called the Psy Amp, which was that sort of little Frankenstein arm with a ball in it that sticks out, because uh, we didn't have any animation on the hands of any kind. We couldn't, we couldn't afford to do anything like that. And essentially, you had a whole suite of, of effectively magic spells that you could you could use from that hand. And you, and we had three, and we had sort of three maximal classes that you know one one class specialized in using the sort of the, the psionics spells um one class you specialized in weapons one class specialized in hacking you, you could you could basically go off that main pa class path but it was um but it sort of gave you a start in, in that class it was it was a very difficult game and pretty um you know i think to to a it, it, it could be fairly obtuse at some times, but we were trying to make it less obtuse than the predecessor because, um, you know, the, that was even, that's a game, like I remember when I first bought, Paul, I remember when I first bought um, System Shock 2. It was such an odd duck, System Shock 1, sorry. It was such an odd duck that, and, and, that I looked at it like for a year and a half before I bought it, because I kept looking at the box and being like, what the hell is this thing? I, I couldn't figure it out. And of course, this goes on to be one of, like, if not my favorite, one of my favorite games of all time, and a game I ended up being fortunate enough to do a sequel for. I couldn't figure out what it was, like who that guy on the front was and, and, and all that. And I think that, you know, at that point, the accessibility wasn't really even a notion that we, as an industry, really had thought very much about. And there's some good things, I think, that come out of that. Um, because... I was playing the game the other day, and you know, there's a lot there. You know, like in terms yes. of depth. it's it's hard and it's complicated, but it also gives you a ton of freedom. Um, it, it, it's it's certainly a game. Uh, both System Shocks were games that really rewarded you for, uh, you know, kind of pushing through the early learning curve uh, because there was so much to discover. You know, one of the design philosophies that we had that, that went back to the uh, Ultima Underworlds was to create games that um, you had a lot of choices. And, and, and we didn't tell you what the good choices were or bad choices, even if such things existed. So you were really just thrown into these worlds, which were typically quite hostile. Uh, System Shock 2 being a perfect example, where pretty much everything around you is trying to kill you. Um, and it, you know there's a, a survival horror element to it. Um, and you kind of had to figure out first how to survive for, for more than a few minutes. Uh, but then there were so many options. And again, since there, wasn't a, there wasn't a guiding hand. You know, we didn't have a quest arrow saying, you know, go north, young man, and uh, pick up this item. It was a pretty free form, what would be called open world now, uh, game environment. And, and all of that led to uh, a lot of emergent gameplay and a lot of discovery. But... The front end of that for a lot of players was just kind of intimidating and, and what is this thing? <laughs> and I, think, so it, I think something that is that jumps out at me, uh, having gone back and played the first game and the second game, I actually played them out of order. Like when I first was a player, I played System Shock 2 and it wasn't until years later that I got into Shock 1. But you were talking about accessibility. I think what's interesting in a lot of ways is that Shock 2 is more accessible as far as like you have FPS controls and, and things are kind of more readable and your objectives are tracked a little bit more um, intentionally. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, Ken, you guys uh, added a lot of systems complexity to, to Shock 2. Like the, the crazy thing about going back to Shock 1 is it doesn't have all these RPG elements. There aren't classes and you're not like getting experience points and leveling up like the, the uh, you know, economy that you buy stuff out of the vending machines wasn't even there. So was was that kind of 
I, I'd be interested to hear what, what you guys thought about that at the time, you know, Paul, when uh, Irrational was pitching, we want all these stats and, and extra systems and stuff layered on top compared to what the original game was and how you kind of uh, gave them guidance on that or how involved you were with the design of the second game back at the home office. Um, yeah, well, the uh, System Shock 2 was, was co-developed between uh, Looking Glass and Irrational. Yeah. Um, but the... Uh, you know, I think it followed the larger arc of the design philosophy that, that again, sort of started with the Underworlds. And the Underworlds had more of a, a one leg in the traditional fantasy RPGs with very uh, clear stats, you know, strength, dexterity, and so forth. And we started to get away from that with System Shock 2 and Thief um, in terms of abstractions. And so I think, you know, Yes, System Shock 2 has a lot of systems in it, and you can develop different psi powers, but we, it, it's framed more in a way that, that feels emergent in the gameplay you're doing. It's not an in-your-face kind of stat thing. Um, it's, if I was really this hacker character in the, you know, in, in, in this near-future scenario, what are the things that I would learn how to do? What skills would I learn how to develop? At least that was the... The, the meta goal out of it, but but I'll let Ken talk to the talk to that part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as I said, it came the the, the sort of the sort of heavier focus. It would probably had a more similar focus to RPG that a game like Underworld did in the sense that you know System Shock One didn't really have it was more of a Zelda thing where you'd acquire new tools as the game went on, but less of a choice of those tools. We kind of felt to push even more in the RPG direction simply because we were honestly very worried about how we um, compete. Uh, you, you know, when you start, you don't know if the story is going to be any good. You don't know if the art's going to be any good. You don't know if people are going to respond. And, and so you, you're always stuck saying, well, what can we do to stack the deck in our, in our favor? What's going to make our product unique? What's going to make it special? And remember, at this point, only one of the three of the partners had ever shipped a game before. You know, John and I had worked on Thief and a couple other things that looked like this. But we, we were complete. I mean, and, you know, every developer in the room probably just cringed because... The difference between shipping one game and shipping no games is is insanely huge. And what I did not know could fill, you know, several very large volumes. And I was around guys like, you know, Tim and Doug, all and, and all, you know, I I I, I knew them, I interacted with them, you know, and they had a huge amount of knowledge base that we didn't have. So I'm sure we we made we stumbled along the way. But there's also I think a term, you know, which is the genius of the novice, or I think of it the genius of the idiot who doesn't know what he's doing. Which is, you know, you don't know what's not going to work because you've never been punched in the face with failing with it. And so probably if we do it all again, we wouldn't have been as ambitious because, you know, oh God, it, it, it was a very, it was like, look, every game I've ever worked on that's been good has been incredibly difficult to, to, to make. And this was no, this is no different. This is no different. Um, I, I, I'd love to jump in and talk a little bit about, uh, you know, as you were talking about er, earlier, about that, that, that sense of obtuseness and that you're not exactly making it very clear to the player. Are you, are, are you doing the right thing? Are you making a decision that's going to benefit you in the course of your play? And while that, that does sound, I think, a little bit daunting at the outset with, with the system shock with Underworld and in other games of its ilk, like, you know, that, that follow maybe, um, well, well, obviously, Thief uh, and, 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 and Deus Ex. There's that sense of discovery and invention that I, in, in my memory, I, I felt more ownership over the experience that I was playing than you know even other games now that are kind of about a sense of meaningful choice. That you know back then it was like if I can get out of this bad situation based upon just all the various ways I've built my character or or, or the inventory I'm allowed to carry with myself, it, it, it really kind of stayed with me in my sense of kind of emotional. Investment in the game seemed to be so great. I, I imagine you guys didn't anticipate that at the outset, but you know, I, I would love to just hear more of your thoughts on not giving the player a ton of information, but giving them all of this opportunity to just figure out their own very personal style of how they're going to play it. Uh, well, that, that was by intent. Um, the, the term we use today, I, I don't recall if we use this term back in Looking Glass, but the, the other side, we talk about it player-authored experience, which is something you can do uniquely in the media of, of games, and, you know, video games, computer games, which, you know, linear media, movies and books, you, you really can't do, uh, do effectively. Um, so we really tried to empower the player today to make their own choices, 
sort of discover the world, decide what was right for them. And you know, one of the hallmarks of that, when you know you're doing it right, it's if you have two players who've played through the game and they have very different stories to tell about the experience. It's like, I, I think I was playing a different game than you were. Um, and it's, it's not, you know, that approach is not uh, universally the right thing to do for every game by any means. Uh, but it was the approach uh, design sensibility that we, we were using on these games. And it is still pretty unique. You don't see, you see very few games that really embrace a, a th that are brave enough at some, at some level to embrace this. Because if you, if you give control over to the player, you're taking it away from you as a game designer in, in a meaningful way. Uh, and that's kind of scary. And, 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 and obviously you cannot probably account for all the different permutations of how someone can play the game. There, there's a point at which you can probably sort of test it, you know, okay, I'm going to build my character this way and play it in this manner, but you kind of got to let the little birdie fly and see if it can actually get airborne. Well, I mean, that's the problem. I mean, you do have to account. Like, th that's why these games are so daunting as a, de as a developer, because you do have to account for those things. So otherwise, you're going to have some very angry, you know, gamers on your hand because the, the, the possible states the game can be in is not, you know, is, if you think about a game like The, Walk like the Walking Dead, you know, Telltale's game is a great game. There's only so many states, you know, probably several hundred states the game can ever really be. Where the game like System Shock 2 or Underworld, there's literally, you know, X to the Y to the Z to the M states. It can be. And you, those states all have to be tested, and there's strategies to try to develop to test those states. But at the end of the day, you ship the thing and you, you cross your fingers to some, um, especially back then, when we didn't have huge testing teams. I was about to say, did. Did you actually just kind of like have a mathematical rubric of all the different variations and you kind of set that as a path for what probably was a nominal team of testers to just kind of, okay, play it like this, play it like this, you know, play there, it like this? There are things called test plans, which a good QA person, you know, and we had, um, I think Steve Pierce was with you guys, isn't he, Paul? Yeah, yes, he is. Um, you know, Steve could probably talk to this better, but, you know, Steve um, back then and, and Sarah Verrilli and people like that um, were you know, developing plans, and I think um, 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 Lulu Lamera on, on, on was our was was our. I think she was head of testing on this. Um, uh, she was either producer or head of testing. I can't, I can't remember. She was always there doing important things. I know because <laughs> I, I remember and how vital she was to it. But um, you know, you make plans. You proactively make plans. You test certain things, like make go through the levels and make sure when you know you turn all the lights on. That, you know, what happens when you turn every single light and level on to see if the late level crashes and blah, blah, blah. But you do your best, but that's what a good QA person does. You develop plus, he develops things that will push the simulation and the and the game to see it, to make it break. Uh, I'm actually surprised a bit in hindsight that we didn't get into more trouble with uh, this kind of approach of, of the players finding dead ends they get stuck in. Um, I think it was partly because not not what well, we did did some pretty good testing and test plans, but it was also because of the way we designed and architected the the gameplay. You know, we built it around these emergent systems uh, that that ran as little simulations um, had limits themselves. You know, we're not simulating a a real world. We're not. This isn't about reality. This isn't a literal simulation. It's a game, and we're doing heuristics and we're bounding it. So we had some degree of knowledge that, okay, really crazy stuff is probably not going to happen because the systems only simulate within a relatively narrow band. Where you end up getting all the surprises for the player is the permutation of systems. If you have five different systems that can all permeate, then you get five orders of magnitude of variety. As long as each system, though, is pretty bounded, uh, you're less likely to get into trouble with a player getting, you know, in some weird state. Yeah, I think that it's interesting. Like, there's only so much you can do in such a rich set of systems as this, because, like, you know, you, you talk about, okay, you don't want them to be able to like easily break the physics or crash the games by, you know, turning on every light at the same time or whatever. But within the player build system, I I think it's impressive how much you know you guys were able to trust the players to say like, okay, you need to pay attention, you need to figure out how these, you know, different stats work together and how, you know, what you're building towards to like be better at weapons or better at Psy or kind of a middle ground between everything is really your responsibility. Because at the same time, 
you know, in System Shock 2, you can totally make a bad build <laughs> that will get you killed pretty easy. <laughs> Um, and I was going like to say, yeah, that, that's my memory. <laughs> yeah, and it's, like, it's, not like, it's not like you're, it's, you know, I think the balance is you don't want people to just fall into that and by default, like, screw themselves over. But, you know, if you're not paying attention, you can totally put points into places that aren't useful. But I think the opposite side of that that you probably discover during testing and you have to decide what you're going to lead in and not is that people can find these really, really powerful combinations of stats that the designers didn't even imagine were going to be possible, you know. Well, Steve, if you think about somebody like Blizzard does, is you know they do their builds, right, and then they patch it for over years and years and years, trying to make it better and better. Now, ours is a much simpler problem, but I don't know if we ever patch, you know, builds, for instance, in this. Like we basically had one shot at it, and Dorian Hart did most of the um, um, ba the balance work and the numbers work, and he just had to get it right, get it as right as he could the first time. And I think, you know, given that constraint set, he did a real amazing job at, at getting it as right as it was, but. You know, it's a that's a super hard problem because also as the game goes on and you're later in the game, your ability to test late, late stage states is is more limited than your ability to test the game at the beginning. So you have not only is the game later and it's harder to get to those places and test later, but you also have a much higher um, the, the the delta between various builds is much higher at that point. So it's like a, it's a it's a compounded problem. Yeah, and there's totally stuff that you can kind of predict just through like running the numbers in a spreadsheet, but that still doesn't tell you the final player experience, which yep. yeah, you just gotta cross your fingers. <laughs> well, and because the player experience in our minds was about authoring an experience and discovery uh, as you're moving through this world, it takes some of the burden off of the stats and character growth to be spot on and balanced. You know, if you're playing a PvP game uh, or an MMO, you worry a lot more about balance uh, to make it fair for everybody. Fairness here didn't really matter, um, and and so we had some slack on that end. Uh, well, you know, I, uh, I, I, we're, we're, we're at a half hour mark, so I just want to let our audience know that may have just been joining us, which you are watching right now, is the classic 1999 PC game, System Shock 2, and we are playing it with other side games, which is comprised of many people who not only worked on this game, but on the Ultima Underworld series, and this is all to bring attention to the Underworld Ascendant Kickstarter. Uh, this is a, uh, it's an attempt to bring back the very classic open world play as you choose game that was Ultima Underworld. Uh, the, the new game will be Underworld Ascend uh, Ascendant. If you're looking at the crawl on the bottom of the screen, uh, those are the places you can go to donate money to help make this game become a reality. Uh, we are joined by Paul Newrath, who's the founder at Other Side Games and also worked at Looking Glass Studios on System Shock 2. We are also joined by Ken Levine, who is one of the co-founders of Irrational Games that also helped make uh, System Shock 2. Steve Grainer, who is best known uh, for Gone Home as at the, the, the Fulbright Company, but uh, has worked with Irrational and seems to play System Shock 2 on a daily basis, from things that I've heard. Um, uh, Paul, are, 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 is there anyone else who's been joining us now that, that should be introduced? Uh, S uh, Stephen Kick, are you, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Ah. So, okay, Stephen. Stephen can introduce himself, I believe. Yeah, um, so my name's Stephen Kick. Um, hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hi, Paul. Hi, hi Adam. Um, I'm the CEO of Night Dive Studios, and we were responsible for basically figuring out the legal craziness that's gone on with System Shock 2 and re-releasing the game on Steam. Uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, for those of you out there, yes, the game is available on Steam, and I think it's definitely found a classic audience, I think something of a new audience as well. Um, did, did you just work on getting the rights for the game, or I would have to assume that there was a fair amount of technical work necessary so that the game could play on contemporary systems? Um, it's kind of an interesting story. Um, basically, after our phone call with Star Insurance Company, who currently owns the rights to the games, um, I was putting together a team of um, engineers to start solving the technical issues and stuff that, that were currently going on with System Shock. And um, I distinctly remember going on my computer and checking out Kotaku, I believe, and seeing that there was an article about System Shock 2 that had just popped up. And it was about um, a modder in France who had kind of anonymously released an update to the game uh, that allowed it to run on modern operating systems. And I thought that was a really, really strange coincidence. 
Um, so we attempted to reach out to him, but had no luck for, for whatever reason he wishes to stay anonymous. But um, with his patch and, and with some um, help from the System Shock 2 community, um, SS2.org, we were able to get the game up and running. Uh, what, what, why System Shock 2? I mean, I, 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 obviously it's held in extremely high regard these days, but uh, you know, it, it probably wasn't as grand a seller as, as even I think the original Thief game or, or other ones out there. Oh, I'm, I'm curious what, what, what brought you to this game in particular. Um, I've got really, really fond memories of this game. Um, playing it, this is going to date me, but you know, I was in middle school when the game came out. And, I was uh, out of college, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, my friends and I, we were all big PC nerds, and um, I was raving to them about how much I loved Half-Life. And uh, one of my friends said, have you ever played System Shock 2? I said, I haven't even, haven't even heard of it. And so we brought it in the next day, and, um, you know, I remember seeing the box, like the foil cover with Shodan, you know, looking right at you and just instantly having this... Um, idea of what to expect and uh, I went home that night played it and uh, pretty much ever since that moment um, I had you know been inspired to become a game designer um, and you know it's just it's just one of those games I don't I I don't feel like it's aged that much for you know how old it is it's um, it's withstood the, the test of time and it's I mean it's just a fantastic game can I uh, can I jump in? One of the uh, I'm 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 gonna co MC with you just a little bit, Adam. Uh, Sarah from other side is in the uh, the internal chat we have over here. She's ah. telling us that um, there are that other side has ten Steam codes for System Shock Two to give away during this stream, and they're gonna give away those kind of over the course of the stream to people who are in chat, and they've actually picked the first two winners in the Twitch chat already. So the first two winners of free Steam or Steam codes for System Shock 2 are users Dreary or Spider and Nimril. Uh, <laughs> so you guys uh, that are that are in the chat just want a couple codes for um, System Shock 2 on Steam, and there's going to be more coming up as we uh, keep streaming and playing. And and those are courtesy of <laughs> and those are courtesy of Night Dive Studios. Thank you, Night Dive. Oh, okay. awesome! You're very welcome. Very much, Stephen. Uh, so, um, you know, on that sense of, of, of memories, I'm curious, Paul and Ken in particular, I mean, I, I know it's like when I go back and I see old work I used to do, that, you know, what probably is sort of, you know, whatever to anyone else, I know so much about what was probably in my head or happening in my life at that time. Um, is, 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 is watching this this playthrough of System Shock 2, I mean, is, is it bringing back any kind of strong memories, either of the developing experience or, you know, <laughs> Or, or, or just kind of what your thoughts and expectations were for the game when it finally reached the mass market. Well, one thing it brings back for me is that a lot of the development, uh, not unusual for game studios, was done uh, late at night in darkness and reflecting the environment of <laughs> this game, dark <laughs> and dim. Yeah, I, I mean, the, we, the Irrational team was in one room at Looking Glass and sort of people were helping us. You know, it's great to be in the church and Eric Brooks was from, um, from the Looking Glass side who were in different rooms working on different products. But we were there always pretty late and, you know, listening, you know, in a very dark room um, that was probably, I don't know, what, 100, 200 square feet, maybe, 300 square, I don't know. It was not a big and, room. And Ken, as I recall, there was a uh, showdown written in blood dripping from one wall. <laughs> It was my blood, actually. Um, <laughs> you have to sacrifice to make these kinds of games. And but I, I think that was kind of critical, the feeling of, of, of late night. Um, like the memories, I, there was, I was obsessed with this album by Betty Severe at the time. And I remember I would listen to that album over and over again. And just being in that dark room, I think partly, uh, it's sort of, I think I associate that room with this game. I don't mean just this game, but, but when I sort of remember the visual of the room, I sort of feel, it's a similar memory to the visual of the game because the lights were never on really and it was always coming from, uh, light was always coming from some the window shades were always drawn and there some light was coming from some you know monitor and um, that's it sort of like this space with fewer monkeys <laughs> uh, yeah, and i think also highlight something that, that, that we haven't discussed yet but this is i think one of the strongest memories most people have of system shock 2. it was extraordinarily scary and tense that it, you, you know it doesn't even like sort of build up 
after maybe several hours and you're starting to get the chills. I mean, I'm say about 30 minutes in, you're starting to dread what's coming around every corner. And I, I, I didn't know, obviously your intention was to have a, a horror theme game and there were survival horror elements. But is that, once again, something that you can anticipate? Because when you're, when you're working on the game day in, day out, I don't know if you guys can actually gauge the sense of dread and menace and malevolence that just permeates this entire experience. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting that we, 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 I don't think we had the full impact of how scary this game was ourselves in developing it. It wasn't until fans, you know, playing it started to write us, you know, letters or, or emails saying that they literally couldn't play it at nighttime. It's too scary for them. That we knew, we knew it hit a certain chord there. That made us quite satisfied. You can, you can try to make it scary. You should, there's some intellectual rules you make for yourself. Like, you know, you limit resources. So the player tends to, um, be very nervous about using any resource. You, you have you die very quickly in this game. Like you don't have a zillion hit points. Um, something I learned from System Shock One is hearing an enemy walk around in the distance. And I wish I could imitate some of the cyborgs of System Shock One. But you sort of hear that kind of sound effect. <laughs> and but not knowing where they were always scared the hell out of me. And so you know we try to basically take these sort of int rules that we understood intellectually that we thought would make scariness. But we did. There's no way, as Paul says, there's no way to know until you, you give it to somebody who's not us. It's not going to scare us because we, 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 you know, we saw it. <clears throat> the beginning. Yeah, I think that um, the the thing that we can't anticipate fully, like, is yeah, you get so um, used to being inside the game as you're developing it, but it's all new to players, and I think so much of that happens in the player's head because we had similar messages from, from people who played Gone Home. And Gone Home doesn't have any any enemies in it. There's nothing that's going to kill you, but people are just like, that dark house, it was just so spooky. I didn't want to go in the next room. It's too, too scary for me. And I'm like, it's just a house. <laughs> but, you know, people, they see that the atmosphere, you know, and, and sort of they fill in the gaps with their imagination. I think that's what scares people as much as, uh, let's say, a, a psionic monkey jump, jumping up around the corner, you know? Uh I, I think another interesting aspect, going back to one of the grand themes sort of, of, of what's happening with, with System Shock 2, and was obviously in, in, in Underworld and will be in Underworld Ascended, which is something we should get to soon, Paul, but you're making all these decisions that are pretty much designed to help assist you survive this circumstance. And every encounter is like almost sort of passing judgment on the wisdom and the efficacy of all those decisions that you made. That, you know, if not even only on an intellectual level, it's I, I, I remember that being also this this moment sort of, of, of tension because even if I could get through that encounter, it kind of gave me a sense of what was going to happen going forward if, if I really even had a sense of survival here. Well, for it is a very challenging game, but those challenges and that that sense of you know, can I survive the next minute, the next five minutes, uh, ultimately becomes very satisfying when you when you can. Uh, and you learn a lot. It's, it's like any challenge. You know, you fail a lot and you learn a lot. Um, and we let the player fail a lot. We let the player die a lot. Um, and, and, and they figure things out over time. And if they look back after they played the game for, you know, eight, 16 hours, there's a real sense of satisfaction in saying, you know, I'm so much more capable of surviving this, this, this environment that's trying to kill me in every which way. Um, the satisfaction is much greater because you have as opposed to you know more common in modern games is to kind of cobble the player more or less make it really hard to actually get into trouble um and you know that can take away from that satisfaction you know you know the game it has training wheels and uh it's just not as satisfying to to, to win at something when there's training wheels on it that's you know, where, I, where i think that Oh, sorry, I, I was going to uh, expand on, or, you know, follow on that a little bit. I, I feel like Paul and Tim, especially your uh, perspective on this, must be really fascinating as designers because, you know, you guys were at the very beginning, I feel like, of establishing what this subgenre is. And then in, in the interim, there have been all these games that have continued to expand on it and kind of change player expectations, you know, and Deus Ex and Bioshock and Dishonored and Bioshock Infinite. Um, and now you guys are kind of going back all the way to the beginning in a way, and I assume that you're you're having to find a balance between taking those kinds of lessons learned and developments that have happened in the intervening you know twenty something years and staying true to the roots of what the the game is. Are you guys finding that to be uh, you know an interesting thing to have to, to try to juggle? 
Uh, yes, <laughs> it's it's one of the reasons it's one of the reasons we're doing this. Uh, what, what's kind of amazing to me is that people still play games like Ultima Underworld, which uh, you know, 22 plus years ago came out, uh, and really enjoy it. Um, the graphics may be incredibly primitive, but the gameplay and the experience, this player authored experience, if anything, I think has more appeal today than it did back then. I think gamers are more sophisticated, uh, and I think after you've played 10 or 100 first-person shooters, most of which don't have really much depth, you know, they're, they're, they're in terms of gameplay, they're, the differences tend to be pretty subtle. Um, that this is kind of can be a revelation for those players that come to these games. So, you know, we, we love revisiting the space that we did with the original Ultima Underworlds uh, that we're doing with Ultima. Ascent, uh, with Underworld Ascended, uh, but we also want to go further. I mean, at, at Looking Glass, we were never scared to take risks, creative risks, and to innovate. There was a fearlessness about doing that, um, and I think that's in part why the games we did, uh, you know, people consider them classics, and why they still play well today. And uh, so that's the spirit we want to carry forward. And, you know, we're looking to. Another way I look at it is I, I'm somewhat amazed how relatively little innovation there has been over the last two decades, in, in particularly in this genre. Uh, you know, the graphics have gotten amazing, you know, the audio, the production values, but in terms of core gameplay, it's it's been fairly incremental, and I think there's a lot of room to continue with it. Uh, yeah, this is this is Tim. I I just want to expand a little bit on on Paul's comments, and that I think that's uh, that's something that really is a big difference between the sort of triple A direction that a lot of especially shooters but other action games in the first person format have gone and you know what we we're able to do at other side as an indie studio uh, on the one hand you know the triple A studio means you get a lot of maturity in terms of of user experience and there's a lot of best practices there that we are able to learn from uh, but on the other hand there's a lot of conservatism that comes with big budgets uh, and with big expectations and and we as an indie studio are able to exercise, I think, a little bit more creative freedom, hopefully, than uh, than you. <laughs> All right, I'm selling myself short, according to Paul. Uh, so, yeah, that's definitely something that uh, that uh, I it, we're we're really uh, we're really ambitious about about some of the the directions that we're that we're still able to go in terms of the player authored experience that that a lot of the big games are kind of a lot more timid about. That note, you know, one thing that I completely forgot about System Shock 2 that's obviously coming back now, and we, and we mentioned it earlier, is you don't structure the game um, with missions. You know, so, so something we are so accustomed to that, you know, the game kind of gives us a set of activities, and that's what sort of facilitates us moving through the environment. Here, you really are like, okay, what's going on? I need to figure it out, and you just have to learn the environment yourself. Um, is that an aspect of gameplay that you're um, looking to explore again? And on that note, uh, Steve, if you wouldn't also mind chiming in, I now realize that you made a game that kind of was based upon that same concept as well. Uh, in terms of mission structure versus more of an open world, um, we explored both spaces at Looky Glass. Uh, Thief was very much a mission structured game by intent. Uh, the Underworlds and System Shock were, were much more open worlds. Um, and they both have their strengths. Uh, I should be interested in Ken's take on this uh, because he worked on both Thief and uh, System Shock 2. Well, Thief, I think we very specifically was an attempt to make a Looking Glass game that was a little more traditional and commercial. Um, commercial in the sense that we saw, you know, it, it's more like to keep that Looking Glass thing. I think we called it. Remember, we called it action RPG until we had it before we started coming up with titles. That it was to take the the RPG notions of what we had and make it bring some more action into it and and be very story focused too, but probably more linear story focused. Um, and um, and that's sort of where 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 Thief came along from. Um, System Shock Two was really much more, as Paul said, more similar, I think, to. The, to the, this sort of looking glass tradition of um, you know of giving you a big world with lots of activities in it. Some of which, I mean, actually there are actually if I'm not misremembering, I think there actually are missions. Like you're actually in this level trying to get off the first deck to the second deck. So you need to open that room with that big robot in it. But 
gainer, is that right? I think that's uh, right. They, yeah, I mean, they're, they're objectives, but it's at the end of the day, one big interconnected space, you can go back and forth between, until you go to the second ship, I guess, but yeah. Right. Uh, but but yeah, it, it was this was more in the traditional styles because I think you know remember this is now we sort of think of genres and it's getting better again now with you know now with digital distribution and and, and things like Unity that you could have a group you know like Steve goes off with a group of a few people and goes and makes you know a huge title with just a few people that can be in a, in a much that doesn't have to sell a, you know ten million units or something so they can take those kind of experiments and Paul like I don't think you'd be able to do this. 10 years ago because you'd have to get on the shelf space. You know, you'd have to get at Walmart. And you'd have to get at those places. Um, and I think that's what's happened now is now we have the opportunity. We, we, we can make riskier games. You can make more creative. We can take more creative risks because we don't have to convince some guy at retail that this is going to sell 10 million copies. So we can really focus on a core audience. Yeah, it's, in a lot of ways, I think of uh, Looking Glass. I mean, Looking Glass, yeah, and, and I'm a fan. I'm looking at it from the outside, you know. Um, but my kind of perception is that, you know, they were ahead of their time in so many different ways. And one of those ways was they were, like, an indie studio. But in the 90s, when you did have to, like, get on shelves and, you know, get, like, magazine advertisements and stuff like that. That didn't always work so well for us, but we tried. <laughs> exactly. So I'm guessing you guys uh, feel a lot more comfortable in the current environment to be able to do what you do uh, no absolutely you know one of the things one of the reasons we decided to bring back the underworlds uh, with underworld uh, ascended is that you know with uh, digital distribution you know through through steam and, and other portals uh, and we currently have a Kickstarter so with crowdsource funding directly from our fans it, it really gives you new ways to explore these kinds of games that they're not mass market you know that a system shock game is never going to be truly mass market. It's not going to be awards with friends. It's not a casual game by any means. Uh, but that's fine. You know, we don't need AAA budget. Uh, we wouldn't want a AAA budget. Uh, one of the downsides of AAA budget, and Ken, you can speak to this if you feel like it, um, <laughs> is that, uh, you know, it, in some ways it creatively, you know, really handicaps you. Because if you're going to spend 10 or $50 million on production assets, that's just this huge weight of, of content that you have to build that tends to be pretty static and it tends to lock you into design decisions you know, long before the game is done because it, it's hard to say, well, we, we made $10 million worth of art, but you know, we really want to change the game design, so let's throw that art out and do another $10 million. You know, It do, doesn't tend to go so well. The other thing that happens if you have a very large team um, is that you know, when we, when we were working on System Shock 2, we could all we were all in the same room. So you, even if you're not very good at managing a lot of people, you don't, you don't need to because you're all just there. So communication is so much easier. Once you start growing to 10, you know, whatever, 100 people, that becomes part of the job. It's just how do you communicate what's going on to everybody in a, in a way that's uh, efficient. And it makes you make a different type of game to some degree. Um, because you, you can't turn as quickly and you can't take the same kind of risks because how do you, you know, not only is there the sunk cost Paul talked about, but just re-communicating what's changing um, is very, very complicated. Boring little things like little things like that that sound like really weird and managerial, that those actually really matter in, in, in the output of the, of the quality of the game. Um, right. And team, team size is an important one because it's just a, there's a human dynamic that if you have a small team where everyone knows each other pretty well, uh, they just tend to be much more effective as a team working together. As soon as you get to, you know, I don't know, 50, 75, more than that, people don't know each other as well. And anyone's role on the project tends to be much more atomic. You know, if you're if you're just doing the animation of, you know, the, the hands of various creatures, and that's your only role on the project, it's a little hard to have a sense of authorship over the experience. And yeah, because so, also, also if things change, if things change, you don't really understand why they change because you're so far away from the center of that decision making. So you get more frustrated where if you're in the room with everybody and you have a conversation like, oh my God, I have to throw out three weeks of work because I get I get why I'm throwing it out. That's a very natural human thing to get frustrated to have your work thrown out. But if you understand why, that makes that helps make everything go more smoothly. 
we had pretty small teams for the for that era in the, in the late 90s working on System Shock 2. It was probably half the size team that was working at other studios, uh, uh, give or take. Um, and at other sides, the same thing. We have very lean teams, um, and it helps the tight communication in the, in the sense of everybody has a big role on the project, which is not more of a sense. It's actually it's, it's vital. Um, but uh, it also has the benefit of constraint, and, and one of the things that you know we've kind of learned over the years is that some of the most creative work comes when there's real constraints. You know, if you have all the budget you need and all the people you need, it doesn't force you to make decisions uh, and decide what's really important. You know, in a game experience. Um, yeah, that, that's something that uh, really you know that we learned. I feel like uh, at at the Fulbright Company was just signing up for those constraints on purpose, you know, like, because I, in, in System Shock, my understanding is that one of the big uh, points you guys made was like, we're not going to have any living, you know, people that you talk to and have a dialogue system with, unlike in Ultima Underworld. So it's just about, you know, there aren't any other living people here with you, so how do you tell the story? And that's where Audio Diaries came from. And same with Bioshock and System Shock 2. It was like the, li the only living people that you see are behind glass, you know, it's really just about you and the environment. And so obviously, you know, with Gone Home, we were like, if it's literally just you and the environment, can that be the whole game? Um, and, and kind of coming from that philosophy of how can you lean into those constraints that do start from what resources do you have and what can you actually pull off, but then making the most of them, I think is core to kind of all of these, these kinds of games. I would also have to assume that for, for, for games like Gone Home, um, and, and definitely like, System shock, where you have such complex systems that can so affect how the players can be changing, that the the importance of that of working in close proximity and having that that ability to know what everybody else on the team is doing is, is really essential. Because if, if anyone was to go renegade and start to do things on their own, it could have a, a, a huge reverberation in terms of other people's efforts on it and, 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 and how the level or the entire game is going to turn out. And somebody might even call the cops on them. <laughs> um, uh, two things uh, back in the, the chat on our side Sarah is saying that there are two more winners of System Shock 2 uh, Steam codes courtesy of Night Dive Studios who brought System Shock 2 to Steam um, and those winners in the chat on Twitch are Astrothom and Trent the Wanderer so you guys just uh, won codes congrats um, hey, Astrothom and, this and Trent uh, Astrothom and Trent the Wanderer. Wanderer. Yeah. Um, and second thing is somebody else is going to have to take over my co emceeing duties because we got a couple busy days in front of us here at Fulbright. So I have to jump off of the stream. But um, thank you guys so much for having me be part of this. I'm a huge fan. I'm just It's an honor to be talking to all you guys because you guys have made such incredible inspirational work. So thank you for having me. And I'm really looking forward to Underworld Ascendant. I am a backer for sure. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for that and for joining us. Uh, Paul, I also have to get back to my my day job here, but um, thank you for. It's nice to nice to hear your voice and Tim's voice and 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 everybody else um, and uh, uh, Stephen Kick and Stephen Gaynor. Thank you very much. Right. Hey See Ken, thanks for joining. Bye. All right, everyone. That was uh, Ken Levine and Steve Grainer, uh Steve of the Fulbright Company and Ken Levine of Irrational. Uh, obviously, we greatly appreciate having them on the stream. And if you're only joining us now. Uh, I am Adam Sessler, and I'm joined with Other Side Games. I think right now we have Paul North and uh, Tim Stelmack. Is, is, is that um, everyone with us right now, Paul and Tim? Uh, we um, might have another guest. Yes, I, I, I think there are more coming, but, but uh, right now the uh, two of the top gentlemen over at Other Side Games are currently in the midst of a Kickstarter campaign for Underworld Ascended. These are gentlemen who come from Looking Glass Studios, worked on the Ultima Underworld series, on System Shock Ship 2, and on Thief, uh, they're all sort of had their hands in, in, in various aspects of those games, and they are trying to return that absolutely beloved uh, style of play-as-you-wish game with Underworld Ascended. We are currently playing and looking at System Shock 2 and having a great deal of memories about uh, what it means to make a game like this, but uh, I think also this is a great opportunity to talk to the two of you about sort of how you look to approach Underworld Ascendant, sort of what aspects, I think we've talked quite a bit of what aspects of these classic games you definitely want to carry over, but uh, are there certain, I don't want to say the word concession, because I think that sounds inappropriate, are there certain advancements, be it in game design and obviously technology, 
that you now plan to incorporate alongside the uh, there definitely are. We talked a little bit earlier, uh, and I don't, I don't know uh, um, if everyone remembers. It was a while ago. We talked about the sort of systems approach that uh, that all the Looking Glass games uh, had in terms of the the systems complexity that leads to, to player creativity and emergent behaviors, uh, and some of the good and bad surprises that can come with that, and the approaches that we take to manage all that. Um, but one significant difference between those days and today is a lot of the systems that uh, were really sort of core proprietary technology for Looking Glass, uh, our rendering system, our physics system and such that, that we, we pushed forward in those days, are very much off the shelf technology these days, uh, which leaves us a, a lot of freedom to build on top of uh, the kind of stuff that we, that we did in those days um, and explore some new areas. So we've been uh, exploring specifically uh, some expansions on on the factions in Underworld Descendants, something that we really only kind of scratched the surface of in the original Ultima Underworlds. Uh, so that we're looking to ex expand into a more fully fledged diplomacy model and AI. Uh, we're looking at some ecological modeling uh, that will tie into the the faction system, so that there'll be you know policy objectives for for the state of the world that the dwarves or the elves or shamblers are going to want to achieve, and they'll they'll have some opinions about what you do in the course of gameplay um, that will be uh, more fully simulated. Um, so uh, in that sense, it, there's a lot of opportunities now because of uh, things that we don't have to, to focus a lot of development effort on to explore some new areas just technologically. Um, let's see. Were, and, 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 and these were all things that kind of, you, you obviously had concepts surrounding them when you were working on Underworld Ascended, but due to time, money, and technology were things you just couldn't fully explore? Uh, sure. I mean, again, we, the constraints, we, we were under pretty severe constraints in terms of budget, team size, and such, but those those can work for you. And it forced us to prioritize for System Shock 2, for instance, kind of what we could model, what we couldn't model. Uh, one of the things you mentioned earlier, which uh, we have, there's no one alive <laughs> You mean system shock? Everyone's been killed off. Uh, so you, you, arri you arrive as the hacker, and everyone's dead before you arrive. Um, and we did that not just so that uh, we did that in part because we didn't want to have to tackle a dialogue system, interactive uh, dialogue system, the way we had in, in Underworld. Not just simply so we could save the effort of doing that, but also because we weren't really satisfied with how dialogues worked in, in the Underworld. It felt stilted to us. Um, and so we were looking for another way to express narrative that wasn't a character, you know, picking from three chat lines um, and going down dialogue trees. And, and that was actually the more important reason why we chose to do it. And System Shock uh, uh, was not the first game to do this, but, but it, it really pushed this approach, what, what we call breadcrumbing the story, uh, pretty far forward. So as you're exploring, you know, in, in System Shock, same with System Shock 2, we took the same approach. Uh, you as a player feel like you're piecing the story together. You know, you find clues, these audio logs uh, of the dead people before you who just drop, you know, essentially hints and pieces of information. Uh, and in your head, you're piecing it together as you go forward. And it is, again, it's sort of a player-authored experience. You feel like you're discovering the story, and you feel smart because you can put... A and B together to get to C, without the game just putting that in your face. And I, I, I think it sometimes has like the, the, the odd side effect that you know only some only some players will find every single audio log or note or, or, or those, those those aspects in games. And sometimes it's fascinating how you start to construct the narrative when maybe you don't have all those elements. It, it can actually enhance or amplify a sense of kind of curiosity than having sort of all of you know. Having every little blank filled in for you in terms of what happened before, what's currently happening. Yeah, that's a great point, and and I think it it kind of mirrors how people think, you know, in real world, right? You don't have all the information typically. Uh, you sort of get pieces of information from various people about, you know, l l let's say that some you know murder happened, and you hear rumors about it, or you read a story in the paper. You sort of piecing together in your mind what you think actually happened based on just a few, usually. A lot less information than the full story 
Uh, that's how people think, and you know, uh, that's how people really think. And so we're trying to create that context. Uh, I mean, it's like any good mystery. Uh, but the difference here is that, unlike a, a book or a movie, we're not, you know, we're not feeding to you that in a linear way. The player is stumbling across that, and because it's open world, and we're not constraining very much where you can explore when, you might find this first, seventh, and twenty-ninth piece, while another player might find the fifth, sixth, and fourteenth piece of information in a row. And it does make it more challenging to tell a story that way. But it's also... I was, I was about to say, I mean, you really have to be sort of careful how you're parceling the information so that it's not just, you know, you can only get some of it and it'll make some degree of sense, but that you get it in varying orders and you can still kind of group it together and, and, and lead some information out. That's definitely true. And it, it actually, it, it it's a an important element of our narrative design approach. Uh, I'm thinking specifically right now of a lot of the work that we did uh, on Thief, where uh, there was a lot of thought given to the various means by which people would get narrative information. Uh, you, know, you could you could overhear conversations in this. We had a, a basically an eavesdropping mechanic. There was in-world lore that you could read. There was map annotations and mission uh, you know mission uh, briefing videos and other channels of information. So there's there was a very specific narrative design that was built around for each for each element of the narrative, categorizing it in terms of, is this something the player absolutely needs to know in order to be able to pursue forward? Is it something that they need to know if they're to be kind of less confused, or is it just like adding depth and richness? And, and by doing this kind of categorization and, and triage of narrative delivery methods, that's one means that we used to, to sort of manage the kind of narrative complexity that you're talking about. Now, is, is that something you do at the outset? I mean, for, for a game like Ultimate Underworld uh, or for System Shock 2, and obviously you know, this, this pertains to Underworld Descendant, um, what are the things that you have to start with first? Is it the story? Is it the systems? Is it, you know, how, you know, is, is I get the, the, the structure of the world, and that's the way in which the character is going to start to build their own story. I mean, it's, it seems like there's so many options, each one, almost like the games you make, uh, <laughs> really is going to sort of change, you know, and start to guide how the development occurs. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think the right answer, or not the right answer, the correct answer is that it comes from both directions. You know, story and narrative are really important. Uh, and the emergent gameplay, the, the, the moment to moment experiences and the discovery is really important. And so we're trying to weave those two things together. Uh, if one or the other is heavily, you know, sacrificed, uh, you just don't get a good experience. So the trick is, is that you can't develop those simultaneously. You can't have your story all written out like you would a, a novelist might. Um, and you don't know all your gameplay. You have your best guesses about how the gameplay is going to work from moment to moment. And so you're sort of constantly iterating back and forth, adjusting the story, adjusting the gameplay to see how they play off each other. And that's, that's challenging. One of the ways we've been able to do that, and we'll do that with Underworld Ascendant, is that the, the story is not a monolithic, um, you know, heavily scripted, by any means, the other way around. If you think of the original Underworlds, uh, Ultima Underworld, the story was actually very light. You started in the, you were, you were thrown in the, in the Stygian Abyss, uh, uh, locked in there at the beginning. And basically, you had to find seven artifacts. It wasn't much more than that. Uh, but the meaning of the story was much richer than that. And, and we, we were able to get a lot of story out of the fact that you mechanically were basically just you know, finding out some artifacts, which you did not have to find in any particular order. Um, and when you, you, know, you got all the artifacts, it, it, it drew you to the end game. Um, so... Uh, Mechanically, it's not hard. It's it's hard to combine the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay and have a compelling narrative at the same time. And then I would have to assume that through the course of development, so you have sort of the mechanics and you have the story, and they're both being developed out, I guess, simultaneously. How do you try to keep those from not constantly coming into conflict with one another, or that there suddenly is contest? Will story win out over... Uh, 
what the mechanics are going to be and or vice versa. Uh, creative conflict is a good thing. We like That's creative true. conflict. It, it, that mashup and that tension is what gets great stuff done. Uh, so you just don't shy. It's going to happen. And you're going to have stuff that breaks and doesn't feel good. But it's through that process of iteration and and, and things don't work. Uh, I think, you know, people who aren't, you know, don't have experience building these kinds of create, you know, these games uh, uh, sometimes don't understand that when you go into a project, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, and there's a process of discovery for the team about what the game they're going to make. And if you think you know what you're going to build, you're just fooling yourself. Even if you've done this for 20 years. Um, in fact, that's a really a disadvantage. You, you have to go in kind of with some degree of naivete and some degree of, you know, we don't know what the this is going to come out with. Uh, because that'll that'll allow you to really open up and, and creatively find the, you know, discover the places that work best. Uh, I mean, there's certain things we certainly know that work and, and certain tropes and certain mechanics that are a bag of tricks. But any particular game, there are significant pieces that come through this kind of collision process of uh, intentions that work themselves out. And, and it's almost like it writes itself in some sense. You know, the, the yeah. team is challenged and says, that's not working, that's not working. And the solution almost emerges by itself. Oh. If we just don't have, if we kill everybody off and we have audio logs, it solves all those problems. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think, it, and this something speaks to some of the discussion we had earlier about the benefits of you guys working on a project like this from an independent perspective. Um, just, just, just hearing that, like that, that really is kind of an essential creative process. The creative person to me thinks, oh, that's that, that's awesome. But I can imagine that for people on the business side of things, that sounds terrifying. That you'd be like, yeah, we don't really know what we're going to do. We're going to keep on fighting until we figure something out. <laughs> I think it definitely um, speaks to what is so important and essential about sort of games being made out of an independent financing model. Uh, so this is Chris Siegel. Uh, I'm the producer on the project. And basically what Paul just described is agile development, which is used all over the industry. But oddly enough, we don't build our games creatively like that. So, you know, nothing that we're doing is new. We, we apply these kind of theories in our life all the time. We're just not applying them to the games that we're making. Why do you think that is? I mean, I, I, I have a couple of ideas in my head, but I'd love to hear it from you, Chris. Um, I think one of the biggest reasons is, is that when you come to a publisher and there's $50 million on the table, and you tell them that there's path B and path C, and we don't really know what the player is going to do, that freaks them out. Because they want to know that every dollar spent is going to be seen by the, the, you know, the, the gamer at the end. And that stifles that kind of gameplay. You know, what's, what's interesting is that's definitely indicative of the more Japanese style of a role-playing game. Uh, just sort of your Final Fantasy, Fantasy Stars. For the most part, you're going to see just about everything, you know, probably outside of sort of deep collection um, elements of the game. And I, I had always read that somewhat as that was just a creative desire to make sure that, you know, I, I've worked on this, that people see it. But I can also see from a business perspective that, you know, you want as much bang for every buck that, it, that has gone into the project. I think the other dimension is that if you're a publisher and you're putting $50 million in a project, uh, you know, if you guess wrong, uh, the product's not commercially successful to justify spending $50 million to make it, you know, the, the risks get very high and, and executives lose their jobs because of that. And so with the high stakes, tends to drive people to be more cautious, tends to drive people to say, let's do something we know that's going to work. You know, this game was a hit last year. We know it worked last year, so won't it work again this year if we you know, tweak it a little bit. Uh, I'm oversimplifying, but but that tends to be the mentality you draw. To. So it's 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 both the we want to make sure that we're getting our money's worth, but it's also a, just a risk aversion. Uh, the big publishers aren't really tend to be in a their business isn't thought of as being, you know, uh, uh, taking risks uh, if they don't have to. Um, you know, if they could make every game was a guaranteed success that, that would that would be that would be ideal as a business 
Um, with the kind of games we're making, we have to take creative risks. It, it's just inherent in what we're doing, and, and part of that is not knowing how the game, what the game is going to be. We can't write down on a piece of paper or create a nice little slick video that says, "Here's exactly the game you're going to get," because we don't know that. And providing that creative freedom and that ability for us to discover is a very important element to achieve to do games like System Shock 2 or Thief or you know the, the underworld game that we're working on now. Um, but if 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 it was done in a traditional retail publisher model with you know fifty million dollar budget, it would be a lot scarier for who's ever funded. Yeah, I will say as as well, like what you can know, uh, just in case that you know terrified Chris, um, is is you can know what your objectives are aesthetically, object what your objectives are, and you can know what your process of discovery is, right? You 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 do go into the project with some very definite plans. What they are not is a specific description of exactly what the player's experience is going to be. Uh, but uh, as a developer, uh, you know what your process is. And I'll point out that, uh, I mean, between Blue Sky and Looking Glass, it's essentially the same studio. We changed our name. You know, it, it went for 10 years, which is which is pretty long in the games industry. But we did a lot of games. And every game that we put into production, uh, uh, we, we completed unless unless the publisher said you know we, we don't want to see this game get released uh, you know it was never even though we took some real creative risks it never stopped us from delivering on the games we were building um, so it's a different thing to say you're taking creative risks where you don't know how the game experience will come out to taking the kind of risk where you're saying we don't even know how to make this <laughs> you know sort of the technical yeah. risks <laughs> You know, we always stayed within those bounds. Uh, we, we knew what was possible. We knew where we could stretch. Um, uh, this is really just goes to the gameplay and the experience aspect of it, which is vital. But uh, uh, it, it didn't it didn't slow us down from making the games. You know, the, 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 one, the one thing I, I I thought I would chime in with on that sense of sort of the cautious and and, and uh, the way in which the and the very conservative way that, that, that publishers like to behave as someone who worked in television for as long as he did, um, I think in a lot of creative industries, uh, that sense of caution and like, let's just do what we know works uh, is, is, is kind of endemic. I don't think it's entirely healthy, but that it's, yeah, I, I think there's sometimes a temptation, and this is for more of the benefit of the audience, to think that there's something you know, unique about the game industry in, in, in that facet, but it is something I think we definitely see in television that we also see in cinema as well. Um, so going back to um, Underworld Ascendant, uh, what are sort of like your, what are the core elements that maybe we haven't talked about? We, we, we know the one big one of, of, of player authorship, but what are those core elements of that franchise or of that type of game that Looking Glass really helped develop that you feel is essential to bring over into the new title? Well, what, one is that it's a role-playing game, genuine role-playing game. So you're, you're developing your own character. So contrast that with Thief, where you, you were given Garrett as a as a a character that you played and had his own personality, his own skills. You know, you, you didn't have much authorship over that character. In, right. in, in uh, Underworld Ascended, it's a genuine role playing game. You, you get to pick what kind of character you want. You develop that character through an arc. It changes quite a bit. Uh, uh, becomes uniquely your character. And any hundred players could have a hundred very different characters that each one to have. So that's a real distinction in that style of gameplay. What we're trying to, one thing we're trying to innovate on with uh, Underworld Ascent is to take the kind of immersive sandbox gameplay that you see here in System Shock 2 and then marry that in a, in a more uh, 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 tighter way with the role-playing sensibility. So rather than being this hacker character who's kind of predefined, and yes, you can learn certain skills, give you much more authorship over the character you're playing. And that will open up new kinds of experiences. If you think of thief, you're always a thief. You're using stealth. Yeah, you could sword fight, but you weren't very good at it. I mean, it was all basically all about stealth. And so that was your narrow band of experience. Now, we did that extremely well, I think, and, and it was great for what it was. In Underworld Ascendant, 
you could be a thiefly like character if you wanted to in, in real life on Thelf, or a fighter type, or a mage type, or some hybrid. And each choice would, you'd end up having a different experience on the game, quite a bit different than another character. Is, is there a chance, and I, 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 uh, this is a, a phrase I believe I got from the author Paul Bowles, um, that you could have too much choice. I think the phrase he used was the tyranny of choice. That Do you guys have a sense that if you offer too much, especially maybe too much too early to the player, that they have no idea, that they, they, they can't inform themselves about how to make those decisions? Is there a, a natural tension in designing these games about wanting to have a lot of options to the player, but there is a, a limit where it becomes more than helpful, I guess. Uh, sure, and I, and I think that was a lesson we learned from the original System Shock in particular, because that was the provided un, you know, an unbelievable degree of choice right up front with very little direction, and I think that, that was intimidating to a lot of players. Um, uh, and, I read somewhere about, you know, at a store, if you go into a, a grocery store, that they work on how many choices you have, that, that if you have too many choices, it feels overwhelming, you don't buy anything. If there's, you know, 27 different kinds of ketchup, you're like, well, I don't know what the best one is, all right, I'm, forget this. Too few choices, and people feel like, I don't have enough choices, you know, I, I want more options here. And so I think there's a human nature factor of how many choices there are, but the interesting thing is that depends on how how much you're into any particular thing. If you're really a aficionado of different catch-ups and you've tasted a lot of kinds, you're probably looking for more choices than someone yeah. who's a, I don't know, just give me the, the regular brand, you know, the house beer. Uh, same thing would apply to, you know, wines or craft beers or games. So I think you do, we are making, you know, as within the system shocks, with Underworld Ascendant, you know, this is for core gamers. This is not a casual game. And so core gamers are for, probably played a b bunch of games and first person games and uh, they already have a, a, a sense of what they like. So they're not coming in very, they don't want something simplistic. They want sufficient choice. So I, we have more latitude there and that's a good thing. The other aspect is it's a matter of introducing choice over the course of the game. So you, you don't want to overwhelm people early on. That, that's accessibility to do that well. But five hours into the game, 20 hours into the game, there better be a lot more choices have opened up to you or you're going to get bored. And so that, you know, progressing the choices, uh, opening up choices, particularly if it's player driven, we like to do things where the player's making the choice about how fast to progress, what kind of risks to take. So if, if a player is very confident and they're, they're a really good gamer and they play games like System Shock 2, my guess is they progress faster and we allow them to do that. I would also add that uh, the role-playing genre is particularly good at doing this uh, in that I find that if the introduction of a new option to the player uh, comes in the form of a new ability that they have gained, they are at that moment heavily invested in learning how to use it. Uh, so yeah. it's, it's a very natural fit. Well, if, you, if you start to see locked doors that you can't get access to, you now know to build yourself a goal, like, okay, I want to play this game and build up that particular skill. Um, on on the topic of, of, of choice, I, I think when, when you're using your ketchup analogy at the grocery store, you use the term best, and I think that must be another tricky thing for you guys to have to deal with, is to condition the players, like, there isn't a best. Everything is a valid, useful, and interesting option, and you don't need to try to sort of second guess the system we put in place. Um, and how, because that's something that you do need to start to instill in the player from very early on, and how do you get them to just kind of go with their own flow and not try to question themselves? Yeah, and speaking of locked doors, you may want to lock yours from the background. So. <laughs> yeah, um, sorry about all the sirens there. I have to live right in the middle of a city that has a hospital very nearby, and a large thoroughfare. So apologies, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, 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 it's a it's it's a great question in terms of you know when you give players choice. Um, is it there in their heads? Are they thinking, I made a bad choice? I made the right choice. Um, again, our sensibilities from Looking Glass and today is to try to not be the judge of that. We as game designers, we're not really out there to say, hey, player, choose A or you're going to be a stupid player. You know, it, it's 
we don't we give you the options and then it's up to you to determine whether that worked well for you and and we try to design the game systems that way too where it's not a black and white where yeah i mean there's certain advantages for your, for any choice and certain disadvantages but it's it's rarely a black and white you know that's always better that's always worse um and you know i think but it is challenging if you're a player and you're used to having a lot of guidance the game that's sort of more on rails and more you know the game designers have figured out here's how we want the player to solve this particular encounter you know when you become accustomed to that then suddenly when you don't have those training wheels on um it, it can become uh you know disoriented in that way because you, you, you're you're waiting for the game to telegraph to you did i do the right thing and the lack of that telegraphing for players can be disoriented and, and it's tough to design that so i think Part of that is similar to what Tim was saying about a, a role-playing game. You can early on not expose the player to a, a, a ton of choices uh, in rapid fire. You can kind of educate them you know, progressively to say, okay, here's a choice. And then you can try to reinforce you had A or B and either of them were completely valid. And, and I think once players get into that, uh, become accustomed to that, and players new to this sort of approach, the hope is that they'll, they'll they'll get more comfortable as they go and, and like it hopefully yeah and this is this is also i would say uh, an advantage of some of the recent developments in the the terrain of publishing and the the what's available to us in the crowdfunding model uh in you know when when the original underworlds and when system shop came out we had the back of the box to communicate to players what kind of game they were even looking at um and here we have the whole kickstarter campaign and then with that process building up a community of people and over the process of the entire development of the game, uh, getting our message across about what kind of game to expect. Hey guys, uh, can no. we begin with our next key winners? Yes, please, by all means. Great. Um, our next winners, um, compliments of Night Dive Studios, are Sonata Fanatica and Carwellis. Thank you. All right, guys, that was Sarah Gerard. She's the, uh, she, she was community for Other Side Games, uh, who just uh, announced two more winners. I have to apologize. I did not uh, note down those two names <laughs> as quickly as they were said. But to both of you, uh, congratulations. You have won, won a Steam code for System Shock 2, which is the game that we are currently looking at on this stream. And with that, I think we'll, we'll take another opportunity to just remind anyone who may have just joined us. My name is Adam Sessler. I'm here uh, really enjoying this, uh, th th this talk with uh, two, three gentlemen from Other Side Games. These uh, are a collection of people that have come out of the, the famed Looking Glass studio that uh, is obviously responsible for the game we're looking at, System Shock 2, System Shock, uh, Ultima Underworld. And this is all happening on behalf of the Kickstarter that they are engaging in right now uh, to help make the game Underworld Ascended, which is a return style of game, the sandbox, play as you will, uh, player authorship experience that was started with the Ultima Underworld series, and that was back in 1993, is that correct, Paul? Uh, the original System Shock was released in 1994. But it was the original um, Ultima. 1990, oh, sorry, 1992. 1992. All right, I, I remember where I was watching people play it when I was in college, but um, I... I, I, I could have uh, taken one year off of the, 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 the age I granted myself. You know, on that note, what, Paul, what's a um, year, give or take, when it's 20, 24 years ago? I was about to say, it, it was all youth. It, nowadays, that's all it is to me. <laughs> um, when, when, when that game came out, I, there really wasn't much in the way of press. To do. We, we did have sprawling RPGs, but definitely not one that was being played from a, 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 a first person perspective in a 3D environment. Um, what was the reaction and the reception at the time? Um, well, it was a brand new experience. I mean, we, we uh, our studio was the first to bring 3D texture mapping to games to create that immersive experience that there weren't games that did that before then. Um, and combining that with taking a role playing game and all the narrative and storytelling and developing a character with a first person 3D immersion was uh, pretty crazy. Um, so we had people, we had some very interesting reactions. We had people who just sort of, you know, jaws would drop and they would just stare at the thing and 
didn't you know had never seen anything like it, which was pretty cool. Uh, the larger experience was the interesting thing about Ultima Underworld uh, uh, is that the game you know came out in 1992. Uh, the first six months a year, it actually didn't sell very well, um, uh, but it started to pick up steam, and and three or four years later, it had, it had sold over half a million copies, which for a PC game in the 90s was actually pretty darn good. It's continued to sell well. And between the two, it's over a million units uh, copies have sold. So it, it took a while to get traction, and I think that's probably a consequence of it being genuinely innovative, that people didn't quite know what to make of it. And it took a while for sort of the, the, the audience to catch up to what this experience could be. Um, um, I, I, I want to talk about what probably was so new and fresh for the audience, but I, I, I cannot help but note the idea that a game could be even allowed that much time to find its audience is almost <laughs> unimaginable now. Um, was, was that just because of where games were sold that you would find that in, 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 in a larger computer store? Because the industry for games had not grown to the point where they could have you know, their own sort of special retail outlets. I think for a lot of people, that just sounds kind of astonishing. Yeah, no, the, the other games, like uh, the, the Age of Empires games, were similar in that they didn't actually sell that well early on, but by year two and three and four and five and ten, you know, the sales just kept on coming. <laughs> uh, but I don't think, yeah, today, in the re at least in terms of retail sales, you could not do that today. Today, it's all about pre-sales and hype. And making sure you know you have a hundred thousand pre-orders or a half a million pre-orders or whatever it is. Uh, if you don't have that, you don't have a AAA title. And so it's 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 like Hollywood. It's like a film, right? I mean, you have to have a big opening weekend or you're you're done. Uh, that's just the uh, business end of of retail gaming, and that's why you know crowdsource funding and digital distribution combined creates a whole new opportunity to, uh, as Tim was saying earlier. You know, it's going to take us the better part of two years to complete development of this uh, Underworld Ascendant. We can have a dialogue and have the fans all participate in that whole process. And we can, you know, so they'll learn to understand what we're building. They can see prototypes. They can see alpha versions. It's it's not this thing where there's an opening weekend and that's the only window to get people on board with what it is. So it, 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 it puts us back in some ways even better than... Uh, uh, the early days where you would have a couple of years to, to get traction on shelf space. Here you can get you can get people understanding and really buying into the vision before the game's even done, which is which is pretty cool. And it's, it's, it's kind of fun to root for creative people. <laughs> that, 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 that's another aspect I've kind of found out of sort of this new Kickstarter and independent model. It's like you're aware of it, you love the idea, like you really I don't know, kind of hold hands and really hope this 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 all comes to fruition. Um, so going back to sort of, you know, people like not knowing exactly what to make of Ultima Underworld when it first came out, um, what aspect of the game? Was it the 3D or was it the play as you will? What, in, in your opinion, do you think was the hardest kind of psychological or, or design comprehension for, for, for the average player to have to get over to really understand what was in that game? Interesting question. I, I don't know. Every player is different. So I think some players, the 3D really threw them, particularly if they were, you know, fantasy role players, because the fantasy role playing games before then were all 2D kind of overhead. Um, some were sort of faked isometric, but it was a tactical view. And it was typically, you know, often turn based, slow pace, uh, very different kind of gameplay. So that's if that's how you thought of a role playing game. And suddenly you were in this fluid 3D first-person environment where you come around a dark corner and a monster's, you know, slathering there. Um, that's kind of a shock. <laughs> uh, so I think for some players uh, that that aspect was a, a, a learning curve, a new experience. But the other thing wasn't had nothing to do with the visuals or the 3D. It was this open-world sandbox play, which really wasn't being done then. Um, that whole sense of okay i'm in this vast underworld and i could go in five different directions and head down i could go left and then go down that direction and explore a subterranean stream or i could clamber down the shaft and enter into this you know giant chasm or i could go to the dwarven mines uh, and the game's not telling me which way to go 
uh, you know, it's all kind of open. Uh, I think that aspect uh, was another dimension that could be challenging for a lot of players. I mean, I, I, I think definitely, I mean, I, I even know as someone, I, I know this, you guys played arcade games as well, that, you know, I come from this original tradition of almost, you know, an absurd level of memorization of, of, of enemy behavior and sort of how, and, and playing to the music inside of the game that it's almost like just sort of a, a, a Simon Says type of way that, you know, back, back in the 80s. And just the idea of like, you know, relatively early in the 90s, you know, we were talking about 10, 12, 15 years. It's like, hey, here's the world, have fun, we're out of here. <laughs> it, it, it definitely is, I mean, it's kind of phenomenal when you consider how quickly things could advance to something like that. But also uh, very easy to understand that it, it, it was a hard thing to try to articulate to the player and have to get their heads around it. Well, what, one thing that helped uh, uh, is that it, it, for a fantasy game like the Underworlds, you know, a lot of us did a lot of, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and pen and paper role playing. And in those games, when I first started playing those games, which would have been about 1975, when they were still on mimeographed, you know, copies of what was before, uh, you know, you could buy a, a D&D book. These were like, you know, you know, Men in Magic and stuff like that, these prequels. Uh, but but it was still the concept was there of which was totally novel for its time that you had a dungeon master creating a world and then the players would interpret it and and come up with their own way to play and that sensibility was really what fed into a lot of the things we were doing with underworld that let's create a world that you as a player uh, could sort of make your craft your own experience in uh, which is very much a pen and paper kind of mentality Moving on to, uh, I'm curious, I, 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 Paul, I, I can't remember how much you were ever attached to the original Thief game, but, uh, and so, so forgive me if I'm asking this question inappropriately. Um, first person by that point was not a mystery. We had already had Julie Quake. You know, these, these, it, it, it wasn't something sort of technically that people had to get their minds um, wrapped around while playing it. But I think stealth from that perspective was an entirely different story uh, and a game that was wholly dependent upon that. And I, I think just by virtue of the fact that Garrett had a sword, it became almost confusing to me. I mean, I kind of wanted to default to that and just kill everybody, because that's what most first-person games like condition need to do. Um, but sort of, how did you see the reaction for that game when, when, when it came out? Because it was another example of you guys going for something very new and different and innovative. Yeah, we, we wanted to break the rules and the expectations in the first-person space with that. I was a creative director on that project and, and sort of came up with the original concept, but it was a, a quick side story. We're, we're obviously playing System Shock here, but a quick side story on Thief is that the game started as, as the Dark Project based around a uh, Arthurian legend flipping it around so the good guys were the bad guys or vice versa. And and we our folk, what we wanted to achieve, uh, 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 Doug Church had a big role on that project. And, uh, he and some others really wanted to do a, a delightful, especially delightful, sword fighting game that had a you know, really cool first person sword fight. And after maybe a half a year of trying to make that work, uh, we couldn't figure out how to make it fun. <laughs> and, and so we sort of hit a hard spot of saying, you know, boy, you know, we, our whole premise, core premise for this game is going nowhere. And, and that's when we pivoted and said, Let, let's do stealth instead. And, and, we do have sword fighting in Thief. It's not the most interesting part. You're not even very good at it. The stealth became the, the, the way that we took that forward. Um, but it was new a new experience because people were played first-person shooters back then. You know, you gunned everything that moved. And, you know, you, you were a walking, you know, giant machine gun in a lot of those games. And the body count was in the thousands or tens of thousands. Uh, and if that's what you're used to, you know, Thief is a very different experience. Um, it, it, it really was a patience trainer, is what I used to kind of call it back then. <laughs> but it, you know, it was our most successful franchise of all the franchises we did uh, at Looking Glass. So commercially, it worked out. You know, it wasn't just sort of a, 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 an interesting experiment that, that only appealed to a very, very narrow, narrow slice of, of players. It, 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 uh, it did quite well. Um, 
but then moving on, obviously, to the game that we're looking at right now, which is System Shock 2. Um, I probably have the clearest memory. I was probably two, maybe three years into my career sort of covering the games industry. And that, that I think that there were just there was a weeks or months on end where this was the only game that we were talking about. And that, you know, it's, it's interesting from sort of, as we're talking about the various reactions, that what System Shock 2 was asking the player to do, which still right now seems so sort of innovative, even for its time, I remember everyone sort of, uh, uh, at least among the gaming press, um, really kind of knew what it, it was doing and just could not get enough of it. We did our job then. <laughs> yes, I mean, is, is, do you think it's kind of the apotheosis of what the Looking Glass philosophy was, or was it, is, is there, or is it, or is there any one game you think that that's most representative of what you were always striving to do? You know, we Looking Glass evolved as a studio. Uh, we we grew, we brought new people aboard. Like you know, Ken Ken Levine came about halfway through Looking Glass. Uh, Every team was different, had its own dynamic and its own personality. Uh, we, we didn't try to do the same thing with every game. So I, I wouldn't look at any one game as saying, this is this is represents Looking Glass. It was really an arc. It was a process of discovery for us, trying out different kinds of gameplay. Uh, you see some very strong threads through them. I think they're all, they're, the DNA is very recognizable. And I think anyone who starts looking at, uh, and I encourage folks to come to our Kickstarter site for the Royal Senate, but you'll see the same DNA there. It's, it's been taken forward a lot of years, uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's that discovery and, the, uh, uh, you know, and sort of the tenets of the player is authoring the experience ahead of us as designers. You know, we like to think we're pretty good designers, but the player ultimately is the best designer and we wouldn't, we're there to empower the player. Uh, now, now, obviously, uh, in the wake of all of these games, you know, we have started to see other names. I mean, you know, it wasn't that long before we actually saw Deus Ex coming out. That was probably the next step in this evolution. Um, do you sort of look at games that are about player authorship or, 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 or deep player choice or big open worlds and kind of chuckle to yourself and say, ha, I helped make that happen? <laughs> I mean, do, 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 do you get a sense that your DNA has been passed on into so many other games that have come out in it is fun to see games that, that you say, oh, they, they clearly got this from System Shock 2 or from Thief, uh, or to talk to designers, you know, whether it's Ken who, who literally worked with us and then it's sort of taking forward the narrative direction in, in a whole new dimension with the Bioshock games. Or games like Dishonored uh, out of the Arcane Guys. The Arcane Guys, we've done some work with over the years. Uh, uh, you know, I think Dishonored is... is, is uh, does some pretty wonderful stuff in exploring some new gameplay directions, um, but but in the scheme of things, there's there's precious few of these kinds of games being done. It's still pretty thin. We think there's there's space to do more. Yeah, you know, I, I I think there definitely is as well, and I think there's a lot of. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Um, you know, in the years that I would, you know, be covering the games industry, you know, I'd have a, a lot of interaction with, with, with our viewers. This type of game was the one that was definitely held up as what was most desirable. That, you know, that it really did seem to speak to an innate desire among players to, yeah, I, I think, explore what games could offer that no other entertainment could and that sense of as you were pointing it out that the player really becomes the ultimate designer of the experience because you're really just kind of giving them the tools and letting them go um but i mean have you ever thought like why this seems to resonate so deeply with so many core players out there um, because i think if, you, if you're playing games as opposed to if you're going to spend you know a weekend or an evening playing a game as opposed to watching a, 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 a really good film or reading a really good novel. It's because you, you want this kind of experience. Uh, you know, you want something that you're driving the experience. You know, you're doing more than just pushing a few buttons and, and watching cinematics play in front of you. Um, it's what is distinctive and unique about this media more so than, you know, the other movies. And so for, for the core players even more so, you know, they want to feel clever. They want to kind of discover the world and, and become masters of these little universes. And, and you know, we're, we're 
for allowing them to do that. You know, I, I, I like the idea of becoming the masters of the universe because that really, you know, I, I, I think that really kind of hits on. Because A, you have to build a universe to be able to have any desire to have mastery over it, and then you have to also allow the player to really kind of assume that position as they play it more and more of understanding and having... And speaking, speaking, of the, speaking of the masters, uh, maybe we should let some of our uh, the fans listening in ask some questions at this stage. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Let, let's, let's take a look. Guys, uh, I know obviously you're watching this stream, so let's start throwing some questions here, and let's see if we can get Paul. And Paul, are, are you still there with Tim? Uh, yeah, we're both here. Tim? Yep, <laughs> right here. We'll see uh, if we can get question to you. I think there's a slight delay, so we'll, we'll have to give ourselves a yeah. moment here. Maybe we can um, announce the next Team Key winners while we're waiting. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Okay, so um, courtesy of Night Dive Studios, we have System Shock 2 keys uh, for Mute City 08 and Northeast Monk. Uh, and I will help moderate the questions. Alright. Um... This is one that I, just, I, mean, I don't even know if this exists. Paul, do you have any information about the Japanese System Shock version? Was was the game released in Japan? You know, I I honestly can't even remember if I was aware that it was released in Japan. Maybe there was a Japanese version. Is it is, is that an, a known thing, or is someone asking whether one was done? For, for Someone Japanese? was asking. As, uh, the, the, the implication from the question was that it was a known thing, but I am having the same reaction as you. That I don't think there was that much PC games being released in Japan at the time. Uh, but I, I think also from things I've, I've learned from other studios, sometimes international versions of the game, you guys don't have much of a hand in, and it may just happen sort of after you guys have moved on to many other projects. Yeah, we, we didn't work on any Japanese versions of System Shock. That 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 I know. Um. So, Sarah, I don't know if you're seeing some questions over there. I'm looking for some here. Oh, well, this is an interesting one. I think it's something that, that you know, many people have noticed. System Shock 2 was both a project from Looking Glass and Irrational. And one, one of the questions here is, how much of the design was influenced by Irrational? Well, maybe an easier way of phrasing that is, was there kind of a splitting of the duties, or is it just kind of a melding of the minds? Yeah, um, there's a um, it's more than melding of minds, I think. I mean, the, the Irrational team were uh, a year, year and a half earlier, were all looking glass uh, uh, folks working on games like Thief. And so the, we all had a similar design uh, thought process. Um, and they wanted to, this particular group wanted to set up their own studio. They, they went off for about a year to work on a project, which if I recall, didn't didn't get uh, traction. And so uh, I think it, as Ken, who was on earlier, said uh, uh, they were looking for some funding and, and to keep them going. And uh, that's when we came up with the concept of them, uh, you know, co-developing with us uh, System Shock 2. It was, so it was a very collaborative effort. Uh, you know, Ken was the lead designer on it and, and has a huge stamp on how the, the gameplay came out. Uh, but it was really a melding t of the teams. Yeah, and I also want to... Uh, Ken mentioned earlier specifically the contribution of Dorian Hart, who uh, is very reserved himself about his uh, his contributions to these. But but that's that's why it's up to the rest of us to really tout uh, his genius. Uh, he was the primary systems designer for all of this, and a lot of the way that the the moment to moment gameplay plays out uh, was definitely Dorian's contribution. Yeah, Dorian was a very early uh, very early at Looking Glass. He came aboard at Blue Sky. Um, actually, and uh, you know, there's, Doug Church had a huge influence on a lot of these games. Uh, he was the project lead on the original System Shock, and, and that bears a lot of his stamp. Uh, but we, I think, one of the hallmarks about Looking Glass, which is a little bit, little bit different than a lot of other game studios at the time, is that it was really teams doing it. It was a very collaborative. We put, I think, Ken in his blog talked about, you know, we had we had some interesting personalities. Um, it really didn't matter how you how you dressed or, or what your you know all that matters is how you creatively contributed and we had people um, uh, like the guys doing the audio for 
for uh, our games, uh, starting with uh, uh, System Shock and going into Thief. Uh, several of them came out of a rock band, a tribe, an uh, indie band. Had zero experience doing anything to do with software or game development, uh, but became incredibly talented at doing this because they brought a very distinctive set of skills to the table. Which, in you know, when combined with the other team skills, that's when it really took off. Um, so we have another question from AU Hepa. Um, she's asking, and I think this came up much much earlier when when Ken was with us. How do you play test the level near the end in a systemic game like System Shock 2, where the choices in the first part of the game affect the end game so much? Um, I don't know. If, I, I, Obviously, there's choices in how you're building your character and how you're playing the game. Obviously, this is not the same thing, say, as a, as a as I recall it being anything like a Bioware game where you're making huge narrative choices that then have reverberations at the end. But, but how, I mean, the playtesting, I've always wondered this just sounds so challenging. Um, this is Chris. Um, I did QA for far longer than uh, I want to admit. Um, <laughs> And I actually, that's where I cut my teeth, actually, was at Looking Glass on Thief. Um, I did very little on System Shock. I was busy with uh, Flight Unlimited 3 at the time. Um, but when you have uh, anything that's skill or class-based and you have to test endgame, um, over time, the QA department builds up uh, like hundreds of different load files of characters. You know, and you start using mitigated risk, right? So, all right, we know that the, the melee class hasn't really been giving us much problems, so you start spending less time with that that type of character. But you know that the, the stealth guy has been making the AI go wonky, so you spend more time with that. Um, it really, it, it all comes down to, you know, just identifying where the nits and the problems with that particular piece of software is, and then, you know, focusing your attention on it. I still, I mean, I just tip my hat to, to, to you, Chris, and anyone who, who, to, who to takes on that role of kind of running QA for a game of the, this kind of level of, of, of sophistication. It, it just stuns me. <laughs> it's, um, let's see. Uh, another question here. Um, Gamer Caught asks, looking back, how do you feel about the ending of System Shock 2? Would you have changed anything? And if there's a way to answer this without identifying exactly what happens at the game's conclusion, that will probably be for the benefit of those that may be introduced to it right now. Um, you know, I, th I, I think the, the answer to that is it all goes back to there's no right or wrong choices. We kind of find a path for the players to discover and figure their way through. It's actually hard doing endings of games like that because you know the game has to end. You need to have some way to wrap the experience up in and typically, certainly in, in, in games like System Shock 2, you come to a single ending point. Um, and, and in some level, that, that creates tension with the core experience where you, know, you, you kind of want it. It would be as if you could bifurcate into a thousand different endings. And we hadn't figured out how to do that with System Shock 2. You know? So that would be my answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think that's fair. We, Given what was accomplished in the course of System Shock 2, I think you know not having the dynamic endings thing, which is still something of a rarity in a lot of games even today. I, 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 I think you guys can be forgiven that. <laughs> um, there were a couple questions about Underworld Ascendant. I don't know if you even thought about this level of specificity, but in terms of runes and how the magic works in it, um, it will be similar to what happened in Ultima Underworld 2, and I believe the person was asking for a comparison between that and the Park's Fake Palace, which I know you guys didn't work on, but it was kind of um, obviously inspired by by efforts on, on, on Underworld. I'm, I'm correct that you guys didn't assist on Park's Fake Palace. Right? Um, I, 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 my only involvement was that I... It was one of the number of times over the years that we, we tried to get the rights to... Uh, the Underworld franchise, and so I worked with um, uh, Raf, who was the, the founder of that, to try to get those rights for that game and development. Uh, at that time, EA wasn't willing to, to, to you know, consider that that doing that, so it ended up being Arc Fatalis. Yeah, with respect to the magic system specifically, um, we we do get a lot of positive comments about the the rune magic system, 
and we want to keep what people saw as valuable in there. Uh, Arxitalis, I think they were really interested in the, the sort of power of magic as symbols. And so for people who aren't familiar with that game, they went with a sort of gestural spellcasting system, uh, similar to maybe what you've seen more recently in games like Okami. Um, it was interesting. It was kind of problematic in some ways. We're more interested in, in the idea of magic as language, which is what in the rune magic system allowed you to sort of to, ex to, to experiment with combinations of runes that weren't necessarily documented and discover spells that, that you, you sort of uh, felt more sense of ownership over. And that's more the direction that we're interested in exploring in Other World Ascendant. Um, and I think this may be our final question. This is from Trent the Wanderer, who I also think was one of our winners of the, of the uh, skin code. Uh, will Underworld Ascendant give the players a chance to build meaningful and specific relationships with individual NPCs based on their actions and affiliations? Um, that obviously is something that we, we, we see a little bit more and more in, in, in some games out there. Yeah, we, we really want to try to see where we can go on that dimension of it. We, we have the three main factions, the shamblers the dark elves and, and the dwarves and part of the gameplay is uh, the arc of the story is that um you know as a player you can essentially get taken under the wing you know adopted as it were by one of these factions and you know part of that would be a story of of, of you you know but starting in a vulnerable and you know don't know how to survive this space and then having one of the factions sort of take you under the wing your choice um, and uh, uh, help you become master of the universe. And, and we think through that kind of an arc that you can create this real sense of, you know, caring about this faction who, who really helped you survive and, and grow in the underworld, make those kinds of connections. Um, you know, there aren't that many games that have done that, and some of them have done in very interesting, lightweight ways. It was Floyd the Robot years ago. Um, I don't remember is that um, where the player really cares about a character, and, and it's uh, it's pretty cool when you can when you can make that happen. Well, and obviously one of the ways that all of this can happen is if people can donate to the Kickstarter campaign for Underworld Ascendant. That has been uh, obviously it's been so much fun to be able to chat with you guys about this from Chop Two and, and, and look at this from Chop Two. But uh, Underworld Ascendant is the project that Other Side Games is working on. They do need some assistance vis-a-vis uh, -vis Kickstarter, and obviously we're encouraging everybody out there to uh, make a donation to help uh, some of the guys who help uh, really bring together the acclaimed Looking Glass studio that I think is among the most influential studios out there on even games now, despite having made a lot of their games back in the 1990s. Uh, um, it, it, it's a game that I'm personally very excited to play. You're here with uh, Paul Nurath and... Uh, Tim Stelmuck, uh, he's the tallest founder of Other Side Games, and so Tim Stelmuck is the lead designer on um, um, Underworld Ascendant. Uh, I had an incredibly good time uh, talking with you guys today. I, 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 I hope this has been somewhat enjoyable for you as well. I, I have not, throughout my career, had the opportunity to uh, speak to you guys and speak so specifically to the accomplishments of, of uh, uh, While we watch, Will just get nailed by <laughs> Um, yes, that, that, Adam, this, is, this has been fun for, for Tim and I. Tim, right? Oh, absolutely. It's been a ball. <laughs> no, we, we enjoy this. Uh, I haven't played, I have to admit, I haven't played System Shock 2, and uh, last time was probably more than a year ago. Uh, so it's been a while. Uh, it's, just, it's just fun to revisit this. Oh, no, it, it is. And obviously, we should also uh, give a big shout out to Steve Grader of Fulbright, uh, the Fulbright Company, uh, for having joined us earlier. Obviously, Ken Levine of Irrational would also come on. And, um, of, of course, uh, Stephen Kick, who uh, is the gentleman who has helped bring back System Shock 2 uh, to the PC. So you guys can play it now. I, I, I've been playing it on Steam and trying to get back into it. Uh, he has been allowing us to give out some additional codes. And on that note, Sarah, do we have any more code giveaways to announce before we wrap things up today? We do. Um, we have... Porch Zombie um, as one of our final winners, and uh, Piran Jade, who had to get off earlier, but we will be sending her the code as well. All right. Um, and then once again, how are they going to be receiving the codes? Are you going to be doing some PMs following this stream? Yes. Uh, we'll PM them through the, their Twitch accounts. 
Awesome. Well, uh, that's that's just an added bonus because uh, I can I think I've been saying many people in the chat who said by virtue of watching this they really really want to go back and uh, play the game again. So once again, guys, uh, please use this opportunity to just throw a little bit of money at the Kickstarter campaign for Underworld Ascendant. Uh, I'm Adam Sessler. I have had an absolute thrill. Uh, Paul, Tim, thank you so much for the two hours that that you have granted me today. Uh, thank you, Adam. Oh yeah, thanks. And, uh, and the last thing before we go, you guys will be doing this again next week, correct? Uh, yes, next Wednesday. Uh, I don't think we have uh, uh, have a time locked in, but uh, we'll be uh, doing a playthrough of Ultima Underworld, which started this started this all. Exactly. A very fitting, very fitting choice. I'm so sorry.